So you uh, studied computer science as well as um, law, and you've you also also experienced in the blockchain scene. And you've worked at a certification authority. So um, you know a lot about uh, confidentiality, trust, and this is the best um, introduction to this uh, topic that I could find. So, yeah, thank you. Our topic today is um, a self-defending vacancy and how we can ensure that after February 24. So, and it's also about freedom of speech or freedom of opinion. And this Ukraine uh, war, the situation, is very challenging for many people. I'm not qualified uh, to talk about Ukraine or to talk about details of the war. But there's um, this topic um, that is very important to me and that I haven't seen raised that much. And this is why I'm here talking about it. And this is freedom of speech in the digital world. And this is a very current issue. Many of the issues um, that I'm talking about are very current and raise many questions. Many people and groups are having to change their opinions right now and change their points of view. So it's always um, important to challenge your own views and we should also challenge our image of um, our own self-defending democracy and freedom of speech. I haven't found my final opinion just yet. I'm still undecided, but talking about uh, what is happening in Ukraine and whether that's good and or bad, both sides are very um, virulent um, on the digital media and there's a lot of um, influencing of opinions in the digital media. And also, social media themselves are involved politically in what is happening. They're um, actors in this whole situation. So, um, we should ask ourselves, when does it become censorship? Are there bounds or boundaries to freedom of speech? and who should enforce them if there are any. It's a very popular quote that you um, should all know, uh, which is, I am not of your opinion, but I'll do anything I can to defend your right to voice it. And this is something that many people say that they would do it. And if um, we say that, we should also allow um, Vladimir Putin to have his opinion, even if it's um, historically incorrect propaganda. So we should discuss if that's um, an opinion you want to hear. Um, that Ukraine isn't an independent country, doesn't have a right to independence. So this is based on an, uh, on basically just false um, facts. So there's a lot of misinformation about who dropped bombs on whom, for example, and there's always um, several different opinions about everything that's happening. 
Also, the population in Russia is being forced to lie. This is something we have seldom seen. And it's all um, aimed at masking um, injustice. So, this is why I want to raise the question, what is freedom of speech and what is censorship? And in my personal um, experience with uh, blockchain, there's many people in that um, topic interesting, but for me, in, in, as a person who was born and raised in Germany, um, it's very challenging sometimes. It was challenging to me at times that um, people there are of the opinion that anyone any challenging to me at times actions. I think our goal should not be to give people who have a lot of influence or a lot of money. I think our goal in speech basically or a more of a platform. And um, the question is also, is it, censorship? Is, it a, is it a kind of censorship if um, people don't really have the opportunity or platform to speak out? But this is just one topic. Um, I want to also look at the um, media in Russia and the democracy, um, forged elections. It was um, before the election um, in Russia, there was a lot of um, gifts given to certain um, parts of the population and also um, independent observers were not admitted to the election. And also uh, when Crimea was invaded, there was one voice against that and that voice of course became a target and other op opposition leaders are either imprisoned or um, being concretely attacked. So about press, press um, is very much suppressed in Russia. There's a few, if any, independent media in uh, Russia, and there's also surveillance and the possibility to just take down any website at any time, and there's heavy regulations um, or stipulations on foreign um, broadcasters. After 24th February, this has become very much worse. It's now, they outright banned the term war. You have to um, call it a special operation, and there's other uh, regulations like that. And many media just gave up and uh, went into exile. And all of this has exacerbated. There are certain words you can't say and certain topics you can't talk about. In civil society, you also see a lot of um, hard action by the authorities. Um, there have been a lot of arrests during protests. Um, allegedly because of coronavirus um, violations, even if the people protested alone. And now um, that they banned the term war, they can um, arrest people based on that. So any criticism is outright banned. And yesterday, or the day before yesterday, or something like that, um, Russia even said that um, citizens who criticize the government should be um, extradited from the country. So this is a quality that we haven't seen before. Of course, there's um, countries where uh, there's certain regulations on what you can say and where, for example, uh, blasphemy or um, other issues 
are um, um, regulated by the law, and we even have such laws in um, Germany. For example, you can't um, insult people in a certain um, position. But what is new in Russia is concrete um, well, terms that are banned. This is a new level. And this makes normal life in that country basically impossible. Not for all, that is. So, as a consequence, um, for the civil society in Russia, there is large uh, divides in between families. So, some members have access to international press or media and see what is happening, and others are completely um, taken up by the propaganda and can't imagine what is happening in Ukraine or outright don't believe it. Intellectuals who have contacts abroad, um, maybe uh, m many IT specialists as well, um, have uh, fled to Georgia. They don't have any numbers on that, um, but there's a huge immigration wave. And this is something the uh, Russian civic society will also suffer from. Um, it goes further than that. Uh, in Russia, you are only allowed to speak positively on about the invasion. You can only um, like applaud um, how important that is for Russia and so on. And then there's this whole Nazi myth. So it will be difficult in, in Russia to reach people because propaganda has just come that far. And it all feels like 1984 by it has just come that well. The um, famous um, vote, uh, freedom is uh, freedom to say that two plus two equals four. And if, if you have that, um, anything else uh, follows. And this is a very fitting analogy, I think, because it's not about suppressing opinions, it's about suppressing the truth. So this is something else than cancel culture, because many um, pro-Russian people always talk about cancel culture or are saying that um, Russia is being cancelled and that's just wrong because cancel culture is about opinions. Someone voices their opinions and other people react and that may not be a nice reaction and the person may not like it but um, essentially it's two opinions clashing but this is not censorship But not only Russia is an actor, in a protagonist in this information war. Ukraine is also very active in Ukraine. Pro-Russian parties have been banned until uh, the invasion is stopped. This is um, certainly debatable. It's, um, we can see that it's uh, very difficult to ban a party. We've seen that in Germany as well. And then in Ukraine, there's also, um, they're trying to put the press in one line, like um, to have them report the same with the uh, justifications that um, you would need to have reliable information. And, um, of course, it's understandable in such a situation of war that um, sometimes certain measures are just needed. 
That doesn't mean that everything that happens in Ukraine is good, but uh, some measures are just needed at the moment. And also in, in parliaments and in, in the Duma and so on. There's a lot of influence on opinions in the parliament that's influence that's uh, certainly justified but still has ramifications on people who uh, make decisions. So let's get to Germany. What happened in Germany? What stood out to me is that um, RT Russia Today um, was banned in Germany. That was a law that preceded the Ukraine invasion. Um, it was um, introduced on 18th March, and it wasn't directly justified with the situation in Ukraine, but um, the justification was that RT doesn't fulfill the standards that apply to German state media. So it's not about the current situation, it's about normal rules and regulations that just apply here. But in the EU, there was an RT Sputnik and so on um, ban in the context of sanctions. And here, um, there's a lot more potential for criticism because um, this wasn't justified with the exact content um, of these broadcasters, but uh, with the war, so it, it's more difficult. And um, other countries like the UK and the US have um, taken similar actions. The media themselves have also um, withdrawn from these countries and um, but other media went back, such as BBC. BBC has returned to writing quite and reports, yeah, such as CNN, are reporting quite aggressively about the situation in Ukraine. Russia is reacting by by basically screaming very loudly and suppressed. Uh, this is, um, these are actions by the enemies and um, they are basically um, trying to counter the measures um, equally. So there's a lot of justifications that don't have to do with the actual situations. There are accusations of terrorism and fake news and um, just outright arbitrary measures, but yeah, Russia wants, uh, lays a claim to uh, freedom of speech, um, but they don't give the other side that same privilege. So still, um, the question is, why does the West react like that? That's uh, certainly a justified question. In Ukraine, we can see that there are some legitimate um, protection interests um, that have to be weighed against um, freedom of uh, speech and um, human rights. In other um, countries, that's different. But um, I would like to talk about some principles. One is uh, freedom of speech. This is a human right, a basic human right um, in democracies. About uh, well, de democracy can only coexist with human rights. So if there's no human right, uh, there can be no democracy and no rule of law. And the last point is um, division of force. This is um, also not possible without a rule of law. Rule of law means that um, laws are um, being 
in short, so that um, convictions are final and laws are being um, applied in a just way. Legislate, you can rely on that. Now let's talk about uh, the division of force. Um, there's uh, the legislative force, so um, in context of uh, freedom of speech, um, this would be um, certain bans. The executive force is, uh, well, executes that, those decisions and the judicative um, force judges in um, cases of um, in uncertainty. So, if there are boundaries to freedom of speech, those cases have to be um, ruled uh, legally. So, it's, it's very difficult to talk about censorship. There may be censorship, but um, it could also be that another um, good is being protected. What is freedom of speech? Freedom of speech is a subjective right a person has um, as opposed uh, in a state um, to voice their opinion as they like. And um, especially in Germany, um, it's defined in a way that you can say what you want, basically. But it doesn't mean that um, you don't have to face the consequences of your um, speech. So uh, your speech can be banned, certain things can be banned. What is the goal of uh, freedom of speech? It's very important in a democracy. If, you, if we don't have freedom of speech, you can't voice your opinion. And if you can't voice your opinion, you can't vote, for example. You should have to be able to criticize the government. You don't have any um, freedom of speech. It's not possible anymore. This also has something to do with the freedom of press. All people have to have uh, access to this information. When you don't know what true and false is, then it's hard to uh, build up your own critical opinion. So what is really true or false? Who should I vote for, for example? Therefore, censorship in democracies are always uh, not allowed. Then you don't have a democracy in this case if it's there. Freedom of speech is very important and also protected in autocracies or dictatorships. This isn't the case because uh, this freedom actually uh, works against this type of autocracy. Related to censorship and democracy, or when you attack one, you attack the other. To come back to the conflict in Ukraine, it was developed developing very strongly in the direction of democracy and also uh, for application into the EU. Um, if it wasn't a democracy, it wouldn't fulfill the criteria necessary for it to join the EU. It's why Ru Russia wants to go against Ukraine. Now, Russia is active in attacking uh, the freedom of speech inside Ukraine. Also, uh, physically with tanks, uh, violence, and soldiers. When Russia is 
conquered also uh, very dangerous for everyone's life, also for their uh, this um, human rights there. Um, it's not possible there to talk about um, the, the war there. It's not possible uh, there to have a freedom of speech. Therefore, there's a fight there to allow freedom of speech. They're trying to fight against this and to fight against what Russia is doing. That's the situation in Ukraine. Uh, by us, it looks something different. But also here, Russia is trying to influence uh, um, us and to influence democracy and freedom of speech. For themes, for example, anti-EU, there's also the issue of refugees coming from Syria, and then there's coming more, and there's um, a strong theme in terms of what Russia is trying to influence there. And also, the refugees are coming from Syria also because of uh, Russia's influence in the area with bombs. It's maybe not different from what we're seeing in Ukraine. There's an issue of climate change. Uh, Russia has a very strong opinion in terms of what climate change is in the media. There's a big problem. And uh, Sputnik and other Russia media, they're directly connected to the government there. There's fake news there. Also, there's a very strong lobby here. We've all seen this. There's dependency on the politics there. In total, there's a couple of Russia-friendly parties um, in the U.S., also in other countries, and we need to observe this. On the other hand, uh, yes, there's also an argument to hear that um, uh, also democracies such as the U.S. do, do this as well. Why is this only something against Russia? Um, however, we are doing something intensively against it. So there are active protests. You can go out in the street. There's uh, many um, actions on the street. You have to look at the difference, uh, what tendencies we have. So um, the U.S. and other countries um, have and um, those uh, measures being taken by the West aren't always correct, but well, uh, the situation in Russia is that individuals are profiting instead of uh, the general public. Russia is, um, always uses a very strong rhetoric um, against uh, the measures by the West, but um, aren't they basically doing the same thing? I think that democracies should defend themselves. The rule of law and um, a good living for everyone um, alternatives, resilience, 
This is also something we've heard about today, but it goes, it's more than that. We have laws that even restrict freedom of speech sometimes. Um, for example, um, there's laws against manipulative advertisements. And um, you can't voice every opinion. You can't, um, for example, lie in order to um, make a contract. Um, so there's a lot of rules that you can like or you can't like. Um, there are laws against insults, um, slander, a level, um, stealing. So you can't always say what you want. And we're also protecting our elections. We have rules against or rules specifying how you can advertise um, for elections or how candidates can advertise themselves. This is something you don't have in the US, for example. In um, Germany, you can't use um, state media to um, proposition your own ideas, political ideas. So a um, dictatorship that attacks other um, and their countries and um, commits genocides. We have had that before in Germany. And this is why we have certain laws. And this is why um, Germany has some authority also on um, self-defending democracy. We all know the first article um, from the German constitution, the um, human dignity um, shall not be infringed and um, to protect it um, that's the aim of all um, force um, by the state and article 5 defines freedom of speech it says there shall be no censorship so um, this refers to what we've talked about earlier, but there are limitations, for example, to protect youth. And also education. Um, education must be true to the Constitution. So there are limits to our um, democratic, um, uh, our freedom of speech in a democracy. And also, um, sometimes parties have been banned in Germany. And Article 18 of their constitution says if you misuse um, freedom of speech against uh, the democracy, you can lose that right. So. The state has power in terms of defending democracy. And of course, this is very difficult to enforce, and for a good reason. You need the highest constitutional court to approve of that. So there are limits to a freedom of speech to protect, protect, to protect certain interests, like uh, the right to not be insulted or slandered. Now, I would like to come from the state to our social media. Social media are active contributors in this conflict, so there are actions and reactions um, from the media. YouTube has already banned um, the RT Germany channel because of misinformation related to coronavirus, interestingly, and all the other social media. I'll make it short for time constraints reasons. One after the other and all of the um, Russian media, not all of them, but uh, the state media, basically, and um, Russia reacted by 
um, limiting uh, social networks within Russia. So it's very difficult, basically, to get information into Russia right now. So social media have become active contributors in this conflict. But uh, social media only reacted after war started. So the, this was all after the law that prohibits people from using the term war. And it was after the sanctions um, from the Western countries. So it's not really proactive, but it was rather reactive. So the, the reaction by those large corporations came late. It's kind of reminiscent of the capital um, situation last year in the USA, because sanctions also only were imposed afterwards, after what happened. And there was a, a lot of influence um, on the elections, a lot of manipulation uh, in the social media, and they reacted, but that only ever happened really late and after like um, the actual worst case had already come true. So it is kind of arbitrary, in my opinion. Social media and freedom of speech. The question is, can you make social media protect um, freedom of speech? Is that the task or obligation? In that regard, you should always um, differentiate between state actors and private persons. Private persons have um, a right to, for example, um, forbid people from using their business. But also, they have an obligation to adhere to basic human rights. And if that is not the case, um, the state has to intervene. The state has to ensure that uh, the freedom of speech is given or um, that basic human rights are being ensured. So it's not all on the social media themselves. Human rights are global. They shouldn't um, be dependent on local laws, but uh, so they should also extend to social media. So, it's an interesting question. How um, how much should platforms have to ensure freedom of speech, and when uh, should the state intervene? Who guarantees that everyone's rights are being respected, and how can can that be enforced? Um, is that something that should be done globally, or? There are certain criteria that you can apply. One, I would say, is human dignity. So this is about uh, insults, or um, but it's also about um, protecting certain groups. So um, the integrity of certain groups uh, must sometimes be protected, but um, also if um, a state uses too much propaganda and people in those states as well, when um, democratic structures are being attacked, should we accept that or not? Also, um, prosecution, um, 
Is that possible in um, social media to prosecute uh, crimes and how is that done? How um, should attacks on human rights be prosecuted? And how um, should they be amended? So we have to ha um, have prosecution follow suit. And I um, haven't found my final opinion um, in regard to those questions. Okay, so these topics are um, very heavy. That was an interjection from the presenter. So, what is important um, is truth. Okay, I'm getting very bad audio. I'm trying to translate best as I can. Sorry, audio is too bad at the moment. There's people who've been active since 2017. Um, there's the Charter of the Digital um, Basic Rights of the European Union and the um, initiators are from a foundation um, that is called Zeitstiftung, um, but there's also criticism. Audio is very bad, sorry. So, um, the criticism towards this initiative is that it's um, very much um, based on wishful thinking. So, um, what new developments do we have? We have an information war. And uh, certain actors are um, consciously making an effort to divide other democracies and states. But um, that this is a phenomenon that we've always had. So it's democracies against autocracies, but also vice versa. And uh, democracy should also be defended on social platforms. Thank you very much for your presentation. This presentation was very much in depth and also philosophical at times. And I have a one question to the audience and um, to anyone who would like to ask questions and uh, use the Q&A function. So what can we do? Sorry, the audio is very bad. I can't really translate. So you should always uh, remind people um, of the value of democracy. And that it's not always against the state, but you should also uh, fight with the state. Resilience uh, within the population um, should be promoted, and it's very high good. And you should always know that human rights are more important than um, dependencies that we may have or may feel that we have at the moment. 
So solidarity is also important. And uh, the population also has an obligation to defend um, the democracy and the good that we've achieved. And we must find the limits of our freedom of speech and we must find the right level that uh, we can use to achieve progress. Very bad audio, sorry. My conclusion is I'm still unsure. As you may have realized, I've not found my final opinion. But um, I'm happy to discuss with you in the breakout room in a minute. And maybe you have some answers as to what is okay and what is not okay. And maybe we can develop some strategies. And Sorry, uh, the audio is so bad I can't understand a single word she's saying. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again. That is the presenter speaking um, for this very um, in-depth presentation that reminded us of what we have um, in these times of crisis and war. Um, it's so important to remember what a luxury our democracy is. Sorry, very bad audio. So um, this uh, presenter is asking what's true, and this is a very important question. So um, parallel again to your sort of certification authority, are there any um, criteria that we can use to um, differentiate truth from truth information? Yeah, I've um, held a seminar about that, actually, that speaker speaking. So this is a question that isn't easy to answer and that I can't answer in the short time we have here. Yeah, because um, we're quite ahead in time.